In this video, I interviewed my friend Lego who recently climbed the Destiny ranks and became the number one Rumble player on any platform. We explored the methods he used to beat other players, the hardest play styles and loadouts that he faced on his journey, a deep dive on fusion rifles and how you can instantly become much better with them, tons of ways to break the game with amazing damage stacking combos, and even some tips on how you can win the Movie of the Week award from Bungie, which Lego has done many times. This one is full of awesome topics and I really hope you enjoy it. So this is my buddy Lego. Uh, you want to tell everybody um, how you became the number one Rumble player in Destiny? Yeah, uh, so really I think it, the core of it comes down to mental game over just basic like like aiming skill and you know the typical things that people would look for in a Destiny player like people look at movement and people look at just how high, you're, how high you can push your movement and ADS speed and everything to hit your shots and just be as excellent as possible. I play more of the mental game um, and that comes down to what weapons work best for me and radar manipulation. I use the hunter class still void, but before void 3.0 even hit, which was pretty interesting, I was doing all the stuff that void capitalizes on now, but I was just using it to my advantage back then and using all the weapons specifically my trusty cartesian coordinate uh rapid fire frame which has i think like seventeen thousand kills on it now from and i started that season with that weapon and so that was pretty crazy but yeah it was season i, I believe it was 18 it was like the season right before witch queen that that happened okay how so where did you start out um in this journey <laughs> and then like <laughs> how good... long did it take you to climb to, to the number one rumble player that's a good question because i i didn't intend for any of this to happen what happened was is i just love rumble like i i, I love like i'll say it straight up like i love destiny 2 i love the gunplay i love mixing space magic with the weapons and pushing everything to the extreme as far as i can and rumble is one of my favorite places to do that because it really tests like okay it's you against everyone and just see what you can do whereas in quick play you kind of have just randomness stacked against you and supers all the time so rumble is a place that I can just free reign, let go, and see how good I can do. And I'm pretty like beat my head against the wall, competitive person. Like if I'm doing terrible with a gun, I'll push it until I make it work for me, but I'll also switch out stuff until I find what I'm most successful with. So what happened was, is I was just playing Rumble like normal, and then one of my friends was talking about his, uh, just his ranking uh, ELO on Destiny Tracker. And I, I never really look at that stuff much. I always thought, and this is funny, I always thought that whenever people talk about like saving their ELO um, when quitting a game early, like I thought that's what they were doing is protecting their ELO. I didn't realize it was just like in-game stats they were trying to protect when they left the game early. And so I was like, ah, oh, these ELO players, whatever. And then I started looking and I was like, hey, this, this is actually kind of cool to watch my rank climb as I play better and win these matches. And as long as you don't, you basically have to win first or second place in Rumble every single time if you want to see yourself continue to progress. And so I looked at my rank and I was like rank eight. It was somewhere in the top 1000. It was like 900 or something like that. And so I thought to myself, I was like, what if I could get to the top 500? That would be pretty cool if I could get to the top 500. And so I just started pushing at that point and it, surprisingly made it to the top 500 within like such a short period of time i don't remember because the rest of the grind is what sticks out to me i just remember that short period of time where i was like okay i'm gonna go for the top 500 and it was like in a week i was like oh i'm in the top 500 like what happened <laughs> you know i felt like i hardly even pushed it at all and then i kept going from there and just started posting on twitter like hey that was a little fast let's see if i can get to the top 150 and then next thing you know, I was at top 150. I was like, let's see if I can get to the top 50. Like, that would be insane to get to the top 50 solo players in Destiny 2. Like, there's just no way I could do that. Because I know that I'm good with my game sense. But my aim, like, just, uh, just an example of how my age affects me like i cannot use sidearms without the full auto trigger <laughs> sidearm i'm the same i hate using it without full auto <laughs> dude i just I have to click every time bugs me yes i can't do it like it it just especially the faster ones and so my favorite sidearm in the game has become the farewell sidearm from season of the splicer because it's a lightweight moves around super fast but i just put the full auto mod on and just full on hold down the trigger because it's so easy to get the best speed ttk out of it um and so i just i just kept pushing not thinking that i would actually get that far and you throughout the journey you start seeing the same people 
over and over again and other people who are kind of grinding it out to get to the top two and you you make some enemies you got hate mail because they hate the way you're playing and then you make some friends that are like oh i've been facing you a lot i hate playing against you but it's always fun to see who can get in the top two uh and so you, you just keep pushing keep pushing i made it to the top 10 i was like man how did, how is this even happening and twitter the whole time i was posting updates as i got top 50 top 10 they're like keep going keep going and whenever i got to i think it was like top five or something like that dylan dmg was like keep going you know and that was the motivation for me i was like okay <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna freaking do this you know and i got to the top two in console uh, and it kind of splits it up on Destiny Tracker, at least it did back then, to where if you just looked at the rank, it only showed console. If you you had to specifically go to PC to see the PC ones, it was like hard to see them all together. Okay, yeah, I gotcha. And so I knew I was in the top two, but the, there were like maybe three or three to five people that were even further on PC. And I was like, man, I'm never going to make it to that. But if I could just make it to top console Rumble player, that would be pretty incredible. But the guy who was in number one rumble player in the world on console kept pushing so hard because he knew all his friends tagged me in my twitter posts like hey this guy's coming for you don't let him get it so we just started going back and forth just every day just so many rumble games um and i just really nailed down what is it that makes rumble what it is how to win as quickly as possible and really a lot of it comes down to speed and time to kill values and so that's why i fell in love with that lightweight sidearm but I just kept going back and forth and back and forth until finally one day I was like, I think I could do it today. And I'm married. I have a, I have a kid and everything. And so I, I texted my wife and I was like, hey, I think if I take today off and I just no life destiny, I could become the number one player in the world. And she was like, <laughs> do you really? And at first she had some hesitation. She was like, uh, do you really need like you became the number two in the world? Do you really? I was like, oh, my gosh. Are you? I was like. You, you realize that I could say I'm the number one in the entire world at something like that would be insane. She was like, no, you're right. Like as soon as I said it, the words came out of my mouth. She was like, do it, go for yeah. it. And like, so I have to do this. Yeah, exactly. It's like, there's no way I can't try. And so I just went for it. And that day I, w I, I faced the guy who was in number one that day too. And I we were messaging back and forth. And I was like, I think I'm going to catch up to you today. And he was like, I think you will too. I have to go to work. Like I can't like keep grinding it out. And uh, I was like, oh, and so unless I, cause you go down a lot. If you get third place, even you'd have to play like six games, number one to like oh, catch, to catch up. back up. Wow. Yeah. So that's, it's like crazy. It's intense. If you lose even one game or this is the worst is in rumble. If you join in progress, like destiny tracker doesn't count oh, like I that you realize so that a joint in progress i wow, had that's crazy i had two games in a row where i joined in progress and got fourth place one time and that was like a bummer day i was like man this is gonna take a whole entire day to catch back up so stuff like that would happen but that day dude i just killed it, it i had my friends join into a playstation party chat and they were there with me like my normal trials team in the chat whenever i like made it because i don't stream or anything i'm just a guy who loves destiny as you know i've started making youtube videos over time but back then I was just like, it was just an accomplishment for me and, and Twitter that was following along. So it was just a journey, man. It was so, so fun. And I feel like I learned so much and I'm able to like comment on different play styles because you saw everything. Everybody abuse, like it's like trials where everybody abuses the best stuff, but to an extreme when you know who the top players are, you're like, okay, I know their play style is this. I know that play style counters my play style. And it's changed over time, but the same concepts still apply. And that's yeah, really cool. That's cool. I have so many questions about this, but I'm curious. Uh, one of the things that I thought was cool when you were first telling that story is a lot of times newer players come to me on when I used to stream more, like when I you know post YouTube videos or in Discord, and they'll ask me like how to make new friends. And one of the things I always tell them, because this is what I did when I was trying to make a lot of friends, I didn't know a lot of people, even long before I got into content creation, I would just play with you know, regular PVP players. And I wasn't really all that good at the time, but I would just, you know, notice he was a good player and I try to like, you know, befriend them. And it's like, over time you build up a pretty good roster of people that you can play with. Yes. So I think that's kind of cool to hear that from your perspective, especially in rumble, which is kind of like a, 
hyper competitive in that little arena. I actually have some pretty good stories about that too, because I played a lot of Rumble in D1 too, and a lot of the people that I ended up playing Trials with even in D2 were from people I met in Rumble in D1, which is the same kind of thing you're talking about. You just start messaging each other. And then in D2, specifically while I was going on that Rumble spree, one of those guys, uh, Scorchy, he is on... Uh, t- I met him, we talked on Twitter, ended up playing some trials together and stuff, and he ended up winning movie of the week. The last movie of the week I won, he won it the same day that I did for the new emblem that they have this season. And so we kind of got to celebrate each other and we met each other in Rumble while I was going for the number one Rumble player. So, Oh man, uh, that's so cool. Just crazy <laughs> stuff like that. So definitely made some enemies too, but I made a lot more friends and that those are the things that stick out, not really the people yeah. who are mad at you, you know? So I want to know, um, first of all, when you were playing Rumble, what were the most difficult like loadouts or play styles that you came across that made it really tough for you to win or to at least to get like top two or three? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think there are three that stick out to me. One of them is just a exact counter to the way that I play. So I play back then and it's even better counter than it was because rapid fire frame fusion rifles aren't as popular and they're not as good as they once were back in that season they could map at 15 up to 20 meters even sometimes if you had the right perks on them and that rapid fire frame shoots so fast you just don't see cartesian coordinates and zealot rewards that frequently anymore everybody uses main ingredient and so Mm -hmm. back then just that speed that you could get stuff out at that close range that's just the complete counter to it was titans using Antaeus wards the the timing of the slide will just bounce that fusion shot right back at you and so i had one player and he's on my friends list still because i was like oh this is we ended up talking about it afterwards but i was like that is a perfect counter i could not do anything he would slide around the corner with a it was just a normal not a slug shotgun but just a normal pellet shotgun but the timing he would wait and not shoot right away, wait till it got closer, and right when it would be my range to kill him with the Cartesian, he would have that shield come up, and even if it didn't kill me, my shots would block back at me, and it would damage me a little bit, enough for, like, it was almost like blinting with the shield, yeah, and yeah, then he would hit with his, yes, and he'd hit with the precision shotgun, not the precision shotgun, just the normal one, and just, it would one-shot me every time, and there, he timed it perfectly, Every single time around the corner, I even when I try, I have picked it up since then to use for different things because it's just so good and not that many people are using it right now. And it's a it's a very effective counter to fusion rifles. Yeah, it's funny when you play against players who really know how to time that slide. It's so frustrating. Um, so just to be clear, you were using sidearm and fusion for most of this time. It sounds like yeah, I your, did your main combo. I did go back and forth because I there were some maps like sometimes you we didn't have the huge dysfunction or anything like that back then, but disjunction. But we did have uh, widow's court, and there were some bigger maps like that where I just needed the lightweight speed to get around because I use graviton forfeit for my helm to pretty much be invisible all the time which is ridiculous that you could do it back then but you could and did a lot of radar manipulation stuff um but my sidearm that was the best thing that i had multi-mock was really good too so i bounced back and forth between those two multi-mock and the lightweight sidearm but back then lightweight pulses weren't as good as they are now and they're not even great now they're okay um and now we have the lightweight bow that i wish that i had back then because i would have mained that probably with gut shot because it's such an Mm -hmm. easy body two body shot kill at long range that you don't have to be super precise for so anything that lets me not think as much as possible and lets me think about the mind game and game sense rather than my aim being perfect those are the type of things that i was running not to say that perfect aim with the highest uh ttk possible would be better but just it's the op you're not always doing the optimal thing when you play you know, 30 games, 50 games of rumble a day. <laughs> yeah. That's funny to hear you say that. I have a, a, a buddy who, um, we talk about like the meta all the time and different things. And I've, especially like I've done a lot of Kovacs on, um, aim training where mm. I'm like, you know, I notice the difference between like how easy it is to click like the big circles versus the little circles. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it just, it to me, like has a lot of parallels with destiny with aim assist and it's like, and dif- you know, just how easy different weapons are. And um, it's funny because like on one hand, there's like this argument to always go for like the absolute optimal TTK stuff, Mm -hmm. um, which I mean, of course, is great. And I like to 
you know, hit optimal TTK as much as I can. But then there's also something to be said about just like leniency and ability, like ability for you to hit like a really good time to kill, but you don't have to think about it as much. It's almost yeah. like, you know, you can kind of focus more on your movement, on your um, game sense around you and like that kind of stuff instead of having to hit every single headshot perfectly or else you get penalized with yeah. a tougher TTK. Totally. Yeah. I'm all about that, that mindset. And what's cool about that is there are some resources available to us. The Destiny Massive Breakdown, their spreadsheet has not just like the optimal TTK, but like the realistic TTK. I can't remember what they call it on the spreadsheet, but if you go on that side and you're looking at weapons that might work for you, there's a, well, if you hit this many body shots and this many headshots, these are the actual TTKs, not just the optimal. And that's an interesting thing to look at if you're really big into primary weapon gunplay. Yeah, that's a really cool resource. I've I've looked at that myself too. And it's uh it's always interesting to kind of see how those things line up with like all body shots, optimal versus kind of like the more realistic TTK that most yes. players would hit. Yes. And as far as the other two play styles that really got to me, these aren't just an exact counter to the way I play. They were just really good. Um, and I'm curious to see how those players are now. I feel like I, I need to, I wish I could do a rumble checkup. Like how did this top player do? Cause there's one guy who was in the top 10 who played an arc class. And this is before arc 3.0. This is before void 3.0 even hit. Um, and he was playing the, the arc class to where when you dodged, you had a little bit more damage resistance and he just timed his nade perfectly every time, just basic blinting hand cannon stuff. And he was just a really good hand cannon player, but he always knew how to dodge right when I was shooting the fusion. Like he knew who he was up against because we played each other a lot. And it, there's just a timing thing where you can get down. Okay, this guy uses this kind of fusion rifle. And when that guardian charges that fusion rifle, you know that they're going to release it at this time and you dodge and there's just no way they can hit you or you jump, do a double jump as a stompy hunter just at the right time to dodge it. There's stuff like that that just works really well against me. And if, if somebody's using their cover and, and they're not putting themselves out in the open, but they're still rushing around the map with, with stompies or something that gives you that lightweight movement, even if you don't have a lightweight weapon on, that's dangerous to go against. That's that's a, a really good play style. I know it's simple, but it's very effective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I think there's a reason we see stuff like stompies so frequently, right? It's like, it's... It's very powerful in Destiny. It's very good. And then the last one that's like a little more unique is uh, there was a Warlock player that I played against a lot that just used uh, his floaty Warlockness to, I'm pretty sure he was the one running Fighting Lion in a primary. And he used it very effectively all the time, just floating around a corner, shoot the Fighting Lion down, get the buff, tan cannon or SMG shot off. And there was just little you could do unless you really knew like how to bait him in. But even then, he just always had ammo because he was using fighting lions. So that kind of play style is really hard to fight against when you're in a 1v1. If you're in a team setting, you can kind of go against the warlock who's floating in the air. You're like, oh, I know he's going to float around this corner. I know to watch out for him here. But in a rumble setting where you're also looking behind your back every second, that's just really tough to deal with. Yeah, especially if he's putting in damage like that against you when you're, um, you know, you're out in the open and he can like use the Icarus dash behind to get back behind cover and exactly. all that. <laughs> exactly. A lot of lot of things. Have you played against, there's a player um, on PC named Epic Defender who does like a double grenade launcher build. Oh no, and I've never played against it, that. Dude, it is the most frustrating. <laughs> he's, he's an incredibly good player, but it is the most frustrating thing to go against because it's like, you'll get hit with the fighting line and then a special grenade launcher like back to back almost instantaneously and then watch him like Icarus uh, dash behind a cover <laughs> it's yeah. like it feels you feel so helpless against it but yeah. um, there's there's certain play styles out there that you don't really come across that much because they require a very different type of mastery but mm -hmm. it is pretty crazy when you see those things in the wild off the top of my head there was one and this is a freebie there was an extra one which I never see anybody run this ever but they were using the high jump uh, with the Hunter Stompy build to just get so ridiculously high. And I'm not even sure it will work anymore with the way they've nerfed Amos' stuff, but he was using a primary. I can't remember if it was an SMG or a hand cannon, but he would just be so high that on console, which is where I play, like the lobby just couldn't keep up. They just couldn't aim fast enough. It was similar to, I guess, the Warlock play style where they're just floating around and you're trying to keep your eyes on the ground and everything else going on in your radar. But they would every time that you knew they were there on the radar, you'd come around the corner expecting them to be there. Even a normal height jump, 
that a hunter would do and they would just be uh, you know a third higher than that and so it's hard to keep up with oh that's cool um so i wanted to kind of shift focus a little bit into some of the more kind of broken busted things that <laughs> you were able to find in your journey um in rumble and i guess we could also touch on like if you were to start this journey off again today like how would you approach it differently given oh. the current sandbox and the things that we have access to these days man uh yeah there's a lot of stuff <laughs> um so what i found back then was primarily it's something you see now with void 3.0 but Invis is so incredibly strong and it was even stronger than it is now. Just nobody was using it to the effect that it is being used now for some reason. Um, because back then you didn't have the void kind of silhouette over the Invis. It was just straight Invis. So it was very hard to see. Um, and then on top of that, you had radar manipulation, which everybody crutches so hard on their radar um, all the time. Uh, and so I, I mean, that's just a given in any destiny scenario, you're basically playing the game, looking at the top left corner of your screen. You don't really look at anything else. Um, and so the things that I learned to do, I guess over time had more to do with the weapons available that were strong to me at that time in this day and age, um, everything's changed so much that there are two weapons that come to mind that are like really I guess broken would probably be the best word to describe them, just stuff that's really hard to play against. And those two things are now, I guess, instead of the Cartesian coordinate fusion, the burden of guilt is probably the sleeper pick in the fusion arena. Um, a lot of people don't realize how good that fusion is. They're still clutching onto their main ingredient, which I am glad to see main ingredient changes coming in the 12, hopefully soon. Um, but a lot of people don't realize just how good burden of guilt is. I could get into why, but just real quick, just generally also on top of that glaives are just incredibly strong right now to a degree that in rumble there's not much you can do and they balance they try to balance themselves out in this way where in quick play or in trials you just can't let your team get shot and them get the shield because that is kind of the balancing act they have to get a shot out first not saying it is completely balanced i'm not <laughs> making any balance statements or anything like that but what i am saying is that in rumble that balance goes away completely like then one negative side they can accomplish on some random other player in the lobby and then they have shield basically the rest of the game if they play it right. And that shield currently is a 75% damage reduction in PvP, which is just insane. So that, that is was, yeah, immediately where my mind goes. Because especially now that they've adjusted it, the meta, or not the meta, but yeah, the meta, to where you now pick up two of those special ammo uh, bullets, I guess you could say, in the glaive, rather than a normal special weapon, you pick up one. And that lets you get twice the amount of shield energy than you could previous to that ammo buff. And so, yeah, you need two shots to kill, but I think the flip side of that is that's two shots to give you up to 50% of your shield if you get both those shots off. And so that's hard to balance. I'm not sure what Bungie's going to do with that. I'm not sure what damage reduction they're going to give them in PvP, but that is definitely the thing that players are like, oh, how do I go against this? Um, unless they're running if unless there's a stasis player in the lobby it is very difficult to fight a glaive user in rumble that's interesting I, I was considering that once they got buffed they'd probably be really really good for rumble because of that because mm -hmm. you could basically like you said take take the damage on one guy and then turn that into shield which then i mean there's just so little counterplay to deal with it right now i, mean, I guess there are yeah. some options but it's like you know, if you're not equipped with the right thing to take down a glaive shield coming around the corner, it's like you basically just have to run. <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit, which I definitely abuse this on my way to Rumble, is uh, uh, what, what is it? The heavy machine gun um, that you got from you got the catalyst from the Guardian games um, and blanking. Oh, uh, air apparent. Yeah, mean? air apparent. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So they hadn't nerfed it yet whenever I was running the Rumble race. And so anytime somebody left heavy open, it was like, oh, well, this is a free five kills or, you know, four kills because no one can stop you unless they're running stasis in the lobby, which is very similar to the way Glaive operates, except you have it all the time, which just goes to show how powerful it is. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so... One of the things that you mentioned a little bit is 
using a fusion rifle, you were first into rapid fires, and then now you said kind of you feel like you see main ingredient once again <laughs> very yeah. often. Um, so I would love to just get kind of your breakdown, like fusion rifle 101 from Lego. Like, what do you think about them these days? Which archetypes do you feel are the strongest? Maybe which ones should get more love that like they're not used as much and just things to be looking for, for players who want to get better at using fusion rifles. Yeah, no, that's great. I would say the main thing to think about if you're on controller Man, this is going to be potentially a life-changing tip for you, game-changing tip for you. If you're a fusion rifle player on console, I think you might want to look more into range and aim assist than you're currently doing. Almost every player that comes to me is like, okay, I've got this god roll fusion, and it's specced out to all stability and trying to get their recoil direction right, and that's it and maybe like tap the trigger or some other accuracy type perk but most people who run for those perks they go for them because they think it gives them more stability and i kind of approach fusion rifles the opposite direction and that is i spec all into range as much as i can to get my aim assist fall off distance just stretch it as far as i can so the aim assist and the range that it has is the most effective it can possibly be and then bump my aim assist up as much as possible, whether it's a targeting mod or in the case of the Adept Burden of Guilt, an Adept, burden, uh, an adept Targeting mod. And I know that will freak some people out because that actually takes away stability, but I am totally content to run only 17 stability on my Adept Burden of Guilt. It functions perfectly fine, and that like freaks people out. They're like, yo, I can't imagine running low stability on a fusion rifle but i'm telling you if you're on controller and you're using that reticle fr friction and that aim assist to help you connect your shots that's like what fusion rifles are built off of in my opinion on pc it might look a little bit different you might want to spec a little bit more into stability and this is the reason whenever i see a god roll like somebody posts their god roll fusion rifle i'm like well this this might be a god roll for you but it might not be the god roll for everyone because it's going to look so different depending on how that person manages their recoil manually and lets the fusion do work for them versus them doing the work and them controlling the recoil and letting aim assist and range do the work for them. So that that's like a very basic how I approach fusion rifles is letting aim assist and range control most of the power and not just stability and recoil direction. So specifically with that, when you're using a fusion rifle, do you try to aim more at the floor and let the recoil guide up? Or do you try to aim more like body center of mass and then keep the recoil at a certain level by like counter tensioning the stick? I think I al almost always drag shoot it down. So I, I'm not necessarily aiming for the head, but kind of like the chest area and then and then kind of pulling the stick down as the bolts fire so that and it, it gives you a real nice combination of aim assist stickiness kind of pulling on it and then also you pulling it down to account for the recoil and there's and that's why i think there are some fusions or some recoil directions or some aim assist numbers that'll work for some people and not for others because they're frankly like to me the the sensitivity on their controller um, or maybe even their mouse and keyboard, like how they have their mouse and how hard they pull it down. It's got to connect at just the right point for the aim assist and the way that they pull down in it, uh, for it to connect and everything to feel just perfect. And I feel like I've nailed that down for me. Um, and this is going to surprise a lot of people, but when, when the number one rumble player in the world is running five sensitivity and you're like, Whoa, that's so low. Like, how is that? You know, I was just going to ask about that. So you run five and then do you, what about the ADS side of it? Do you run that it um, I, I don't know it's just a one right. multiplier i don't change anything i just let everything is just a straight five and i know snipers are real big on that i, I think some people have talked about before how if you're relying more on aim assist and drag scoping you want that low sensitivity so that it mm -hmm. like really sticks on target and it's kind of the same concept for fusion rifles and i think a lot of people miss that i talk I've talked DM'd back and forth with people who are having trouble with fusions and and take to my suggestions. They go for more range and more aim assist. And then I ask them, what sensitivity are you running? And it's almost always I'm at 15 sensitivity. I'm at 20 sensitivity. I'm like, well, that's why nothing's sticking for you. You're flying by the target so fast. Right. <laughs> yeah, pushing nothing right can out stick. That, <laughs> yeah, like pushing right through that like stickiness aim assist cone area. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. Um, I know uh, my buddy Shadow, who's a very good controller sniper, 
he plays like somewhere in the higher hip fire. Like I want to say like, I don't know, 12 or 15 or somewhere, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. And then he, but he compensates for it by lowering the ADS a lot. So it's kind of interesting to hear you go in more. Cause I, that's how, when I played controller more, that was the way I approached it too, is I'd like to have more of like a, just a low hip fire, but these days I play mostly mouse and keyboard. So, right. Although oh. I did just get a new Xbox controller, so I'm I'm trying to kind of get comfortable again. <laughs> that that <laughs> little is, by little. You bring up a good point though, because that's something that I'm curious how it would affect me on because I pre-charge and aim in like during the pre-charge, and not a lot of other people play that way either. I think a lot of people see my clips on Twitter and they're like, how is this fusion even legal? Like he's basically snapping in and firing, but that's because of the way I pre-charge from the hip and then snap in right at the last second to hit the shot. I don't know if that is helping me in some way, like technically, but it's just the technique that I've picked up over time to see my surroundings as best as mm -hmm. possible and then scope into that one target right at the last second. It looks really cool. I'm not sure technically how much it's helping me, um, but that is a technique that I use just to see my surroundings before I scope in and fire. Well, you do get some benefits too, right? Like where your, your uh, movement speed, I assume, would be a little faster as you're pre-charging mm -hmm. it because you're like having the faster strafe. So it's going to be a little harder for people to hit you potentially if, you know, as opposed to if you're already aimed on, aimed on sites and then, you have like the slower movement while you're charging up the shot. Yeah, and I, I picked that up from D1. They actually, back on the old Crucible Radio podcast, uh, one of the devs confirmed that hit fire, um, the hit fire perk back in D1 would activate on your actual shot if you started charging while you were hit firing and then ADS, and you can get the benefit from rangefinder. So you could get both like a hit fire and rangefinder, yeah. which I don't think that works anymore in D2 given the way that all the perks work like just recently i was messing around with gut shot and how it works with a projectile and if you descope before it like shows the damage number it won't give you the gut shot damage <laughs> at least from what i found it may be something else connectivity wise but a lot of times in destiny it's like you have to be doing the thing to get the perk at that moment whereas in d1 the way the projectiles worked, you could kind of like mix everything together and they would all stack. So I think I picked up the habit from there and just kind of carried it over to my playstyle in D2. That makes sense. So uh, with that said, what is your god role for most fusions? Like what kind of perks and mix of things are you looking for? It's about to change a lot because the number one thing I would say for people to look for is actually Rangefinder, but I'm not sure that that's going to be true after the next patch hits where Rangefinder is getting its damage fall off nerf. I know we'll still have the zoom and that will help a little bit, but there's some research being done right now by a lot of the science destiny community where zoom doesn't matter as much anymore as we thought it did on fusion rifles because of the way they've nerfed the ranges, the range stat, um, where it was the aim assist fall off that was helping rangefinder so much. I have a whole video that's like just a breakdown of Epicurean, a crafted one, and how rangefinder basically makes that gun what it is. And if you're lucky enough to have a main ingredient with like under pressure rangefinder, I'm not sure what the perk columns are off the top of my head, but you can get one of the accuracy perks stacked on top of rangefinder to just go all out on a main ingredient. You have to get, Zer hasn't sold that one though. You could only get lucky from Dares of Eternity, but that's about to get nerfed too. So it's really gonna even the playing field. Rangefinder really is a standout perk right now. But other than that, once you take that out of the equation, it actually gets really interesting because I would say a different thing for every archetype almost, which is hard to answer in a context like this where it's like, what is the one thing to go for um, when it varies so much by archetype since they adjusted the archetypes um they've made it to where every one of them rapid fire adaptive and high impact suffer from not being able to kill it up to 10 resilience at the same amount of bolts you like have to do stuff to it to achieve that consistency whereas precision frames main ingredient or epicurean they will five bolt kill at 10 resil no matter what like it's just five bolt across the board every other archetype's a little different so it's hard to say like this is the thing you want on every fusion rifle when every fusion rifle is going to look a little different um i know that doesn't help too much <laughs> no that makes a lot of sense though um what about stuff like hip fire grip like do you feel like that has value on them or um not so much um i think for rapid fires it could now i know there's people who are fans of it but for me 
the way that I play fusion rifles, and I think this may be important for people who are getting into them to try and get a concept of like, how do I succeed with them? I'm always trying to play in between the distances of like, okay, slug shotgun can hit up to 10 meters, you know, if it has opening shot and like a hundred range, like up to like 10 meters on a headshot. So I want to play outside of the 10 meter range. My fusion can only go up to like, you know, 16 to 19 meters ish, depending. So I really want to get that range down, make that range feel so sticky. Um, and so hip fire grip, usually isn't going to let you hit those ranges, isn't going to give you all the buffs to your ADS fall off, or the, yeah, the, it's not going to give you the buff to the damage fall off while you're ADS to get those ranges. It's just going to feel a little more close range, and at that range, you're in real danger from weapons that can just pull the trigger and kill you and don't have a charge time. So for me, hit fire grip, not, not, not as much. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, rain, range finder, super, super good. Um, and then other ones that extend that are like what range finder is getting taken away, like killing wind that extends your damage fall off by 5%, that kind of stuff, which I think is one of the only perks that does that. But killing wind is just so good on fusion rifles that not very many people go for. I mean, if you're, if you're not going for double kills, it doesn't matter that much, but I'm a double kill fiend like i love that kind of stuff to get charged with light after mm -hmm. a fusion rifle double kill switch to a weapon with harmony you've got charged with light and your harmony going so i i love stuff like that um so what about the new fusion rifle from this season the exotic one that changes uh like oh, no. if you hip fire sideways it's like a duck bill side to side and then if you ads it's like more vertical but what where does that fit in the the spectrum of fusion rifles these days i think it fits in the spectrum of the fusion rifle from Europa that also shoots horizontally. <laughs> it right, is just, a Coriolis force. Yes. Oh my gosh. It is just a bad deal for PVP. I know so many people have requested that I like do a big deep dive on it, but it's just not worth doing because there's nothing you can do to it to make it work. The The closest thing you can get is when they re-enabled your Falcons uh, exotic for Hunter that gives you that 15% damage bonus coming out of invis that activates as soon as you start charging a fusion rifle, you come out of invis 15% damage bonus so it's great for fusion rifles but it you're you're making something work that is just so much effort that you really just don't need to do yeah. I feel like if anybody tells me like oh I've, I made a build that really makes it work I, I know that they're stretching to make it work like they could be running something better and so that that one's really difficult the one that is really interesting to me that breaks everything is Midas Reckoning from King's Fall Raid because it stacks multiple charge time perks to make a high impact not feel like a high impact anymore it's it's pretty insane yeah that's cool i've got a couple rolls on that thing that i've been meaning to test i just haven't yet but um it seems like that one has a lot of potential like i remember looking at the perks when uh, king's fall first came back out and i was like oh man this thing actually looks kind of cool because i i'm usually not really a fan of the higher impact fusion mm -hmm. rifles just because that charge time is brutal but uh that one actually looks kind of cool so brutal yeah and so backup plan on that one since it rolls that in the first column lets you get that charge time that's between i think a rapid and adaptive frame uh on it which yeah you have to have the time to switch to the weapon but if you know the encounter you're getting into like in trials where you can choose when you want to come around the corner get that between a rapid adaptive charge time on a high impact um and backup plan is usually not great on fusion rifles it just takes away too much damage but on a high impact it the high impacts hit so hard that you can still four bolt kill at any resilience level on a fusion that shoots five bolts. So even it, with backup plan, wow, even with cool. backup that's plan. Crazy. Yeah. So, so usually a high impact needs, uh, five bolts to kill. Uh, okay. No, wait, it, it normally a high impact is three bolt kill up to nine resil and needs four bolts to kill at 10 Razil. And so no matter what, you're gonna need four bolts to kill at 10 Razil unless you're adding more charge time, which nobody wants to do that. So four bolts at 10 Razil anyway, why not make it four bolts across the board and have way faster charge time with backup plan? It's a pretty good deal. You mentioned damage stacking briefly from time to time. What about stuff like Radiant? Like where does that fit in with fusions? And are yeah. there other like damage perks that you care about that help it? make it a little easier radiance great because it's basically like a mini like a lot of people search for high impact reserves that's probably one of the number one perks on rapids adaptives right now because it makes it to where adaptives don't need to they don't need quite as many bolts 
to kill and it makes rapids where they don't need quite as many bolts to kill it kind of like puts them in line with the other fusion rifles um, so you don't have to worry about them at higher resiliences so radiant will do that for you just like high impact reserves would i think off the top of my head and what will really do that is something like your falcons which is like 15 percent what gets really interesting to me because i don't like uh it's difficult for me to think about stacking damage unless i'm doing something like really extreme like lowering the bolts to kill a whole bunch like there's there's a crazy build that i've never seen anybody talk about before where an adaptive frame i think it's um the one from the moon dream dream breaker can get like a three bolt kill by stacking kickstart with like your falcons or something crazy like that that like shouldn't be possible on if you made it's four bolt kill across the board but there's stuff like that that's like really crazy um, but the most interesting thing to me uh, across the board isn't like changing the bolts to kill to slightly better, but more so when you stack so much damage that you can basically negate the range cap on fusion rifles, um, specifically high impacts, but also precision frames can do it. But if you, so if you stack something like Harmony with um, something like Charge with Light um, or uh, Jer Falcons, that 15% or a well, uh, warlocks i've heard some warlocks they put down a well come back and slide through it for the 15 percent plus harmony i know that sounds complicated <laughs> but there, there's ways to do it that aren't as complicated specifically your falcons um if they bring it back in its same state where you can just kickstart like it's a free like kickstart plus that that's fit to 15 percent damage boost that will let you get over the amount damage for no matter how far your bolts hit if you connect your bolts they're going to one hit kill that player which is insane for a fusion rifle i can't believe that is still possible in the game yeah that's crazy um one of the other things we talked about a little before we started recording was about um making some of the weapons that are not conventionally good a little bit better with different combos like one of the ones you mentioned was like cerberus with melees and the gut shot straight on the bow what, what kind of combos do you think are interesting on non-fusion rifles that um, kind of make them, like, you know, turn guns that maybe people don't think much about into ones that are a little bit stronger? Yeah, I that's one of my favorite things, actually, is looking at weapons and finding the ones that, uh, I don't know that I would use this because they'll look for a perk, like on the bow, for instance, everybody went for kill clip, which is good. That's great to one hit kill at certain resiliences with, uh, while you're radiant. Um, actually, every resilience while you're radiant. Um, so that's great. It's just precisions are difficult to hit headshots with anyway. And so I looked at it and was like, oh, gut shot. Like you can just two body shot someone really fast. That's awesome. And so other ones that stick out to me is if I just stay on bows for a second, you have one like uh, not by. Bi yeah, biting winds. That one gets swashbuckler from uh europa and if you get one with swash you can just go in and i think it's a one shot kill it's up to like six or seven resil or something like that with just that by itself and then you can stack on radiant um so if you throw a knife with a hunter you could throw a throwing knife and then get that radiant get that swashbuckler times five and you're one shotting any resilience with a bow um for like uh 4.5 seconds which that's pretty cool um and then there's other ones uh, I like stacking Harmony on top of the Charge with Light I was talking earlier. Um, I do that with a bow as well. Wolf Tone Draw is a great one. So you can use a, you know, a shotgun or whatever you want in your kinetic slot, get the kill uh, or get double kill, get Charge with Light, and then move on to your bow with Harmony and that 15% damage bonus from Charge with Light. That will one-shot kill too. My favorite ones probably out of anything is one shotting with the glaive by stacking a whole bunch of damage. And I don't think a lot of people really think about that too much, but there's ways to one shot with that as well, which I have a ton of those. I, there's so many actually there's, it's very becoming more and more accessible. The problem is you pretty much have to have Lubre's ruin. It's one of the only glaives that will do all that damage stacking. None of the other mm, ones have the perks yeah. to be able to do it, but also like hand cannons, like uh, something new or pure poetry, that we have stacking harmony with another damage buff on that for two taps. Um, I love all all stuff like that as well. They're all really interesting. I think with auto rifles and SMGs and stuff like that, the damage stacking doesn't feel as fun to me because it's like I'm just I'm melting people really fast, but it just goes away so fast it doesn't feel as rewarding as something like a two tap from a hand cannon. Yeah, the one that uh, the auto rifle that still stands out to me, I haven't even used this as much lately but i remember when gnawing hunger first like kind of really came back into the mix and there's ways to become charged with light and then also kill clip 
on top of it um and it's just it was like <laughs> insane it was like using a machine gun all the time it was so wild you know uh, but that kind of yeah. reminds me of a, a different perk that a lot of people pass over for stuff like uh auto rifles and smgs is golden tricorn we have now which you could have gotten on the doctrine of pa- or not it's <laughs> the doctor of passing that's not doctrine <laughs> the, the, the trials uh the uh, trials auto rifle yeah so i actually have that on um what's the, i forget the the summoner um, yes yeah, i haven't yeah. used it yet but i've, I've saved that role because i was like this i need to try this sometime it's got gotten really good, really good. yeah trials at one point specifically for arc 3.0 too brought a lot of new golden tricorn stuff on a ton of different weapons you can the new galu sniper can get golden tricorn for one body shot kills if you play it right up to a certain Brazil. um but also the smg that that everybody likes from crucible this season that one can get golden tricorn and it's so easy nowadays to use the warlock melee to go in and and get a kill after you get a weapon kill or even uh, shoulder charge with a titan people using peregrine greaves that's so so easy to get a melee kill storm grenades also because yeah. the only requirement for golden tricorn is just you get a kill with your weapon and then you have seven seconds to get that next either powered melee or grenade kill and then you have 10 seconds of 15 percent 50 percent damage boost which 50 percent is just is ridiculous insane. Yeah. Yeah. so uh, the, you're inspiring me to to get this back out i might have to try it later <laughs> tonight so i've got um i have a summoner with um golden tricorn and overflow together oh yeah so you have like 100 bullet magazine if you slide <laughs> if you pick up special ammo uh and then you know get that uh, crazy damage bonus going that would be really really fun that's good that yeah that's really good too because the my, the one problem i've been facing with it lately when i try it on really like niche stuff like the galu sniper the the sniper from grasp of avarice can do it too um where you 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 have to get a kill first and then use your powered melee or grenade and on weapons like a sniper or a shotgun then it's like well i wasted one of my bullets getting the first kill so i only have like I have 10 seconds of this 50% damage boost, but only one bullet to do right. it with. And it's like, <laughs> it's hard to get a lot out of it. Yeah. That's yeah. not super fun, but you do it on a primary like that. You got overflow. You're, you're set. You're good to go. You just have a melting machine for 10 seconds. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to have to give that a spin later. <laughs> what I really want, I want them to, which they won't do this, but putting golden tricorn on a glaive, that would just be ridiculous, oh my gosh. but awesome yeah, too. Cause you imagine. have it requires some setup. It's not like you just get, a free one shot kill in some ways it's more it's harder to do than my other one shot glaive builds like there's a uh one i have called the yeet machine that's just surrounded plus surrounded spec um but it, it has to be enhanced surrounded that's the only way it works but if you do that you just throw yourself into a group of enemies and just one shot everyone it's so easy to do and so ridiculous but no one really runs that because it's so it's so niche yeah <laughs> That's funny. Um, any other weapon types that come to mind that uh, benefit a lot from those crazy combos? Um, I I really wanted. I'll say what this is one that's like a failed thing that I wanted to work, and that was the new trial shotgun. because uh, we just had it this past weekend, and I really wanted to be able to use golden tricorn or swash or adrenaline on that, which it does work. But the damage fall off, the damage, uh, yeah, fall off at range with Either Golden Tricorn Swash, it doesn't matter. Even just the shotgun by itself is so extreme. Like, yes, you can still hit a headshot up to 10 meters, but when you hit that headshot at 10 meters, you're actually losing a lot of your da- original damage. It's like 250 something for a headshot, really, with a precision, but at 10 meters, it's only doing like 202 or just above 200. And so you're losing a lot of damage. So, what would really be a one shot body shot kill is actually only a one shot body shot kill up to, I, I don't want to say the exact meters cause I haven't done the testing, but it's much shorter distance. It's like seven meters or something. And at that point, it's like, why not just use a normal shotgun? You did all this work for a one shot body shot kill that you could do with a normal shotgun. Yeah. That's the crazy thing about slugs is they kind of, they, the damage fall off ramp is so extreme that it's mm-hmm. like, they'll go from doing like, you know, a crazy amount of damage to like no damage within just a couple of meters. Like it's so fast. Yeah. And so it seems like if you're going to damage stack, you, you got to just go for stuff that lets you one shot body. Cause otherwise like you're not really going to extend your, um, lethality range for a headshot that much by just adding damage. Yeah. That, yeah and that's exactly why I think I'm, I gravitate towards glaives when I'm damage stacking. Cause it's something that just can shoot at 
such a far range and even when you have damage fall off it doesn't affect the one shot kill that much and then fusion rifles they just the damage fall off works differently with those and slugs and shotguns in general are just really punishing right now and i i had an interesting conversation this last week uh with some crucible guys where we were talking about stuff and the words came out of my mouth and tony ill physics was like wait are you saying this right now because i was saying like i wouldn't mind if they buff shotguns like i feel like the meta is pretty nice when the shotguns are strong and people are moving around more and like it's really hard to use a shotgun right now and i wish even i who don't use shotguns that much could damage stack more with them and do more interesting things so it's an interesting conversation yeah that's I, I'm I'd personally be fine with that too. I I didn't really mind how they were before. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like this is a, okay. This is like a, a side <laughs> tangent, but I feel like every time that they make stuff like shotguns harder to use, it encourages people to use other weapons, which I find much more annoying to play against. Yes, like like I will I would rather play a full team of shotgun users than like a full team of grenade launcher spammers oh, or like sure. both. You know, it's like like any other combination, even multiple fusions or whatever. Like. It, pretty much anything because you're, you're unlikely to get hit by multiple shotguns at the same time because of the way you know their range works but like it's pretty likely that if six people have a grenade launcher like <laughs> you're dead yeah. gonna hit you, you know? <laughs> so, yeah no i'm yeah, i'm with you funny. man it, it's difficult to it's a difficult thing to balance because i know everybody will outcry oh these shotguns hit so far it's like well everything else could hit an infinite distance so which one do you want <laughs> yeah it's funny it's funny looking back at old clips um and seeing how much shotguns have been nerfed over time like mm -hmm. for a project recently i was going back through and looking at all my like forsaken era pvp clips and man dust rock blues back then was like a sniper rifle it's yeah. just crazy how different it is today like the the best shotguns we have don't even come close to how that thing was when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with fusions, which is so weird because they still hit from so far. But they were like, you could hit. There was I did a test actually when I was doing the rumble thing. I took a high impact fusion rifle with range finder and put it in a well with Luna faction boots and hit over a fifty meter kill, which is just insane <laughs> that you could do that and it's reined in some from that but that was after the first fusion rifle nerf like so mm -hmm. I, I don't know it's just crazy the 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 range that some weapons have versus what shotguns are left with right now yeah i've kept a few air until snipe clips from back in the day when, <laughs> when he could map people some like i don't know 50 meter kills or something yep, like that yep. it's just so wild what you used to be able to do yeah well hopefully rangefinder will change the changes they're making to that i know they're going to affect smgs i know they're going to affect some other weapons but they're going to hit fusions hard the the ones that actually hit you from really far ranges now those are the ones that's going to hit i hope they do change made ingredient i'm just personally tired of seeing it i would like to see people branch out and try new things but the rangefinder, mm -hmm. i i think that will prevent a lot of the like true maps that are like whoa how is that in the game <laughs> yeah um so you had a couple tips i thought would be kind of fun to share with people about winning movie of the week for the, yeah. the for people who don't know there's like a competition sort of every week in the twab update where you can win like a special award if you upload a movie that um, gets movie of the week so i don't want to take like a, a long time to talk about this but i thought you might have a couple fun tips for people who are looking to win it um based on your success yeah i i'm excited to talk about this because i have a lot of people because they know like oh you've won movie of the week seven times like what do you think about this one isn't this a great movie of the week session or they'll they'll dm me an idea they'll be like oh wouldn't this be cool if we did this I was like, yeah, it sounds cool. You know, I, I can't really participate in that right now, but I always try to follow up with like, if I think this is true. And so I wanted to give the advice to everyone is like, you know, make it something that Bungie wants to win. Uh, like they want to showcase this thing. A lot of times people will shoot me a message of, or they'll tag their uh, Twitter clip with like movie of the week. But it's like something that's like making fun of Bungie, which I know should be like common sense, but a lot of people don't think about that. Like Bungie doesn't want to put a movie of the week that's like making fun of them. If it's a inside joke that's like, look at how huge this boss is. It's so funny. Like that is one thing. But if it's like making fun of something that the developers worked really hard on, that's a tough thing for them to want to support and win movie of the week. So that would be my number one thing is make it something that Bungie wants to support and wants to win so that they can uh, promote your video. Cause that's kind of what movie of the week is. It's like, Oh, Hey, these players either did this incredible thing or this thing's really funny. Basically 
the community will love this, you know, and it makes the game more fun and increases our enjoyment of it. So that would definitely be number one thing. Um, the second thing is it doesn't have to be super long. A lot of people like make clips that are so, so long, but you want it to be engaging. Uh, and it doesn't, most of my movie of the weeks that have won were only like two minutes and 30 seconds long, like something you could almost post on Twitter and that was it. And so I see a lot of people make really long videos, but you don't have to put that much into it. Just make the part that you do put in there. Excellent. Um, rather than just making something so, so long. Um, and those I think are the, like the top, uh, there's a third one. The third one would be, um, use a theme that is important to Bungie specifically that week, like make it timely. Like this week, I think this coming up week could be wrong is iron banner. Iron banner is coming back soon. And you know, you could do an iron banner themed video, or if the Halloween event that's coming up, um, there's something that you want to do for that week, like prepare the idea ahead of time and submit that, like get, get on it. Like as soon as the event drops, like do it, film it that day and then post it and have it approved and everything going out that way. They have time to get it in the, this week at Bungie. Like those are the kind of things I think that really make a difference. I see a lot of people make submissions like the Wednesday of here's my movie of the week and it might be incredible, but it's literally the day before, like the, this week at Bungie is prepared you know, potentially days before it drops. So you really got to make sure the timing is right. It's something Bungie wants to support and it's watchable. It doesn't have to be super, super long. Yeah. Those are really good tips. That's that's everything that uh, you said kind of jives with what I notice when I w read those twabs and see who wins. It's like, <laughs> if you have like a 30 minute video, that's like bashing the game but it's like <laughs> probably not gonna win but you know yes yeah and then community support too i think that's a big thing there like if you do a collab with other people and get all the community from both sides involved in it that has a lot of power um to have community members come involved or get the actual community involved there was one movie of the week that i won that's probably still to this day one of my all-time favorites and that was we created like the original titan bowl which was just this rift game mode where Titans just punched each other and tried to get the rift in D1 um, and dunk it and just made it like a football game. Um, the only difference is we actually got the community involved and we got people playing the game mode all across Destiny, which was wild to see something you created. Like everybody starts playing it in their own private matches and you see streams of it and you're like, this is incredible. Like, so getting community involved in whatever you're doing has a lot of support to get a video out there to win movie of the week well thanks so much for sharing uh some of your tips with everyone this is really really cool i'm sure people are going to enjoy this a lot um i'll link all of your socials and stuff in um the description and whatnot is there any particular place that you think is the best place to follow you like your youtube's been doing really good i've noticed lately thank you man yeah i think youtube really is the primary place like i talk on twitter and answer questions but youtube is really the place if you want to see helpful informational cinematic stuff youtube's definitely the place to go Awesome. Well, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show, so to speak. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> thanks it. for having me. No, for real. Whenever you reached out, I was like, oh, I can, Patty Kicks this is awesome. I can't wait to talk. So yeah, I really appreciate you bringing me on. I love your heart for all these interviews and showcasing different people in the Destiny community and a chance to talk to your community and hopefully bring them something that's interesting to listen to. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah.